Hey everybody, one of the GMG Review. Today we're taking a look at the newest expansion for Warhammer Underworld's Gnarlwood. It's the Fearsome Fortress that goes up for Praetor today. Now this is a Rivals deck. Um, and what's a Rivals deck? A Rivals deck is a universal deck of cards you can use with any Warband. And all you need is their character cards. This is one of my favorite things about the new edition of Warhammer Underworlds was basically the Rivals decks are a a pre-constructed format where you can use it in Nemesis too, which is their like constructed format. Um, it'll add new cards basically to the Nemesis decks. It means you can take any Warband's Warband cards and mix them with the cards from this deck to create a unique deck. Or if like me, you've got lots of old Warbands, going back to the beginning, including the two OG Warbands, which is Garrick's Reavers um, and Steelheart's Champions, you want to use these old miniatures. All he needs are character cards, right? So all I have here is the character cards, and I'm actually gonna use these two warbands from the original Warhammer Underworld Shadespire, um, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, starter set, two player starter set, as my examples of how to use this deck. You don't have a warband associated with it. Anybody can use it, and it adds um, basically a pre-constructed way to play. I love this way, now you're this too. I love this way of handling um, the older warbands and keeping them current. And also I think what's cool is all the newer warbands can play with this too. So it, it gives you sort of a, um, a uh, what was I wasn't gonna say, a new sort of like methodology for playing with uh, these like legacy miniatures because they're still great miniatures. And the characters have done nothing wrong. The characters are all still neat too. So they're fully compatible with everything. So this one's called the Fearsome Fortress, and it revolves around the concept, and actually I got some visual aids here because I figured this would be handy, of feature tokens. Um, basically when you play the Fearsome Fortress deck, as long as one of your cards has the Fearsome Fortress uh, symbol in it, you can then use this card. After placing feature token step, a player using this plot play, uh, card places one available feature token. So the step basically is you place your boards, you align your boards, you place all your feature tokens, which is the five objective tokens, right? The person with priority getting, I think, I can't play, I can't remember which order it is, but either the person that um, did or didn't place the first board. I guess the player that placed the first board, because then they have at least one advantage, gets to place three of the five. Um, when you're done, after all that is finished, a person with this uh, plot will then place an additional available feature token. And if you're both using this plot, you both get to place one. And it's placed uh, within one hex of, no one's territory and no one's territory is defined i'm just gonna use these half boards no one's territory is defined as the hexes the um the hexes that are in between in no man's land so these are the no um no man's territory so within one hex of that would be like here 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 right to place it to place a token um so when you're placing these actually the deployment becomes really important and you would actually want to use probably if you're playing this plot the um, the sides of these boards, these are the Gnarlwood boards, that have uh, deployments like right on the board edge. So all of the no ones territories would be all these half um, plus half ones in the middle here. So you'd have to place it right up danger close. And now all the scoring is done based off that. You're basically building your wall of your fortress um, and you're gonna score afterwards based on where that one is. Uh, it cannot be placed in a starting hex, a block hex, a lethal hex, or a cover hex. And when you do, you can choose which sides face up. If more than one player is uh, playing this, then you roll off and the player who wins places their token first. So you're defining where kind of like your fort is. And then all the scoring is based on that. So for instance, I'm gonna go through the objective cards first. Um, like all these decks, you have uh, 20 power cards and 12 objective cards. And the power cards will make more sense, I think, if we go through the objectives uh, in the beginning. Um, and obviously I'm, I'm gonna use these two. I'm, I wanna try out this deck with these two warbands as well as the ones in the Gnarlwood box. Uh, so I'm going to use them as a reference. So um, let's look at Bold Sortie. It's a surge card worth one. Uh, score this immediately after an activation step in which a friendly fighter's charge action began on a feature token in your territory. So any feature token, that one's fine. Not based on your like little adventure one. Now this one on the other hand, if you got it early, oh my gosh. Uh, score this in an end phase if there's a friendly fighter on a feature token within one hex of no one's territory. So that's either the one you place at the beginning of the game, or if you manage to kill somebody in that central zone, you could then um, place a token there with the reaction uh, loot. I can't write it's, it's like loot or pill pillage, I think it is, but whatever. The one where you kill a guy and you get to put, put a guy down. Um, so if you're on one that's there, 
Then gain one additional glory point for each other friendly fighter on a feature token within one hex of no one's territory. So the more you've put down basically in that zone, you then score this. Uh, and then Earth, so yeah, so Earthworks Surge, score this immediately after a friendly fighter is given a guard token, and that fighter is on a feature token within one hex of no one's territory. So again, both of these require either that starting hex or more that you've put down through killing people. Um, impregnable Defenses, Surge, score this immediately after an enemy fighter's failed attack action that targeted a friendly fighter on a feature token within one hex of no one's territory. So if someone comes onto your feature token and then charges onto it, um, and again, remember, you can place your objective markers there too, right? So when you're splitting up the feature tokens at the beginning of the game, you'll get the one free one, but you've got whichever ones you can deploy, you can start to put them down too. And there's no restriction for where this one goes. So you want to try and fill up that no man's land area as quickly as you can with feature tokens so that you can score multiples of these and then go grab them. Like if you've got three down, conquer domain in the first turn could score you three. Because you've deployed two plus your one extra one, you could potentially score three glory in the first turn if you have this card. Um, Impregnable defenses if an enemy's on it. Uh, lethal defenses, surge, score this immediately after an enemy fighter is taken out of action within one hex of one or more feature tokens that are within one hex of no one's territory. Um, so basically, even if you're not standing on it, just kill somebody nearby to one. A proud Castellan, I love this one, think you can breach Fort Stinkhorn, says Grincrack, this is the new, I'm going to go through them as well, this is the new um, Loon Court uh, boss. Score an end phase if your leader is on a feature token that's in your territory that is within one hex of no one's territory, so basically just be, be on one of those zones. Um, objective, raise the walls, duel, score this in an end phase if three or more feature tokens are adjacent to one or more other feature tokens. And three or more of those tokens are within one hex of no man's territory. So basically, it, you're going to get two on deployment usually because you're going to put an objective one out there, plus you're going to get your free one from the plot. If you manage to kill someone nearby one, you've got like a chain of three, then you're able to do it. Um, and then raw materials, surge, duel, score this immediately after you place a feature token within one hex of no one's territory during an action phase if one or more enemy fighters are out of action. So basically, you, you kill a guy, <laughs> you can see it actually is using one of Garrick's Reavers and he's just making a fort out of body parts. Um, Siege Breakers, score in an end phase if there's no enemy fighters in your territory. So that's an easy one again if it's early game if you manage to get that one. Uh, stockpile, score in an end phase if your warbands hold objectives whose numbers add up to six or more. That's a, that's a, finally, we're using the objective numbers. Yay, so. Now, there's, you start with one to five, so you'd have to, you'd want to hope you got a good draw. This one's a bit random, but if you get lucky, it's worth two. Uh, to the walls, surge duel, uh, score this immediately after an activation step if your warband holds more objectives than any other warband, and each objective token is within one hex of no one's territory in an occupied, uh, hex occupied by a friendly fighter. And then Underground Fortress Duel scored in an end phase if three or more friendly fighters are on feature tokens and two or more of those fighters are adjacent. So if you manage to get those two in the beginning. So it's almost always advantageous when you're deploying your feature tokens. So let's say, I'm just gonna, uh, from, from like the line of scrimmage point of view, um, you've gotten, let's say, three because you won the roll uh, and you go one. It can't be within one of an edge, right? So you'd probably wanna go like that for your first one. Uh, like that for your second one, and then when you place your third one, you could go like this and try and like build a wall, right? So you're trying to literally build a wall between no man's land. Uh, this one would be scored um, in the end phase if three or more friendly fighters are on feature tokens. So like you could get that one first turn with these guys just by walking onto them all, right? Because you could deploy here, deploy here, deploy here. Uh, or deploy here, and then go one, two, one, one. And they've all gotten themselves two more fighters are adjacent, right? And they're all on feature tokens. So it's, again, it's all about building defenses and then moving on to those defenses and then hopefully adding more to it by killing people nearby. And even scoring more if you kill people, people nearby. I feel like this is a really actually a good deck for Steelheart because he's got like, they have like wicked damage output individually. They're all base two. I mean, Oberyn and Severin both start at three, which means they can kill most average fighters just in a single hit. Uh, I think not even inspired. <laughs> like, no, <laughs> his broadsword's just straight up, you know, does that. Uh, and then, yeah, he can mighty swing to hit everybody nearby. And then Angrad's got base two. 
Um, and Oberyn's got um, base three with his knockback one on his great hammer. So they all hit like a ton of bricks. And they've all got four wounds, right? So they they stay they stay longer than you would think they would. Um, so that's the setup. That's what we're playing for. That's the plot. Let's take a look at the gambits and upgrades. I'm gonna do gambits first. All right, so Bound Spirit, Trap, Denizen, Reaction. Play this after an enemy fighter's activation if that fighter's adjacent to one or more feature tokens that are in the same hex as a friendly fighter. Deal damage to the enemy fighter. So basically, um, you're like they, if you're on that feature token, like your wall, and they come to you, and then they just take a damage because you've, you've sprung a trap off the, um, the wall. Uh, Gamma play determined push reaction. Play this after a friendly fighter's attack action. Pick one. Push that friendly fighter hex towards the hex that uh, target occupied during the declare action, um, or one hex towards the nearest feature token. So basically, you can drag people to where you need them to be to achieve these, especially to build more if you want to as well. Um, that's gonna be really handy in the enemy power phase, right? To set up a kill. Now wood tusks. It's a trap reaction. Uh, after this fight, uh, play this after an enemy fighter ends a move action adjacent to one or more feature tokens. They're in the same hex as a friendly fighter. Stagger that enemy fighter. So basically, you're like, it's like, again, you're building like defenses on your walls. So if they charge into you, then you just stagger them, which is, again, debilitating. <laughs> uh, healing ward, choose one friendly fighter on a feature token. Heal one the chosen fighter, which is great, especially with a small, a small count win warband. Uh, makeshift Bombardment, choose one friendly fighter on a feature token, and choose one enemy fighter visible to that friendly fighter within three. Uh, pick one, stagger the chosen enemy fighter or push them uh, one hex away. So you can push people back setting up a charge if you want to. No damage, but stagger is really handy and it gives a kind of like a mini range deck. Opportunistic Reprisal, I love that the art on these is all the old warbands too, because it's clearly made for them. This one's Molog. Um, reaction, play this after enemy fighter's attack action. If that fighter's staggered, choose one friendly fighter. The chosen fighter makes an attack action that targets them. So again, hand, bombardment plays into that. Uh, tusks plays into that. Uh, those are all damage. Yeah, those are all damage. Um, but when you're placing tokens, remember, you could also place them with this side up, right? Which causes stagger. So if you've, if you've chosen to place a token, this is always going to be an available feature token because it's not an objective, which means one of your mid... Well, I should have mentioned that at the beginning. One of your midway throughs could be this thing, right? So you could stand on one and then stagger people with the other one. It'll stagger you too, so you don't want to stand on it, but it's definitely the thing you can place if you want to. Uh, but free actions is a big deal. Uh, ready for anything, plus one defense for each friendly fighter on a feature token in the next activation step. That's pretty great. So, end of your turn, bam, ready for anything. Everybody's on a step we've set up. They're all plus one defense. So, everybody's rolling. <laughs> like, so if I'm playing Steel Hearts, they're all rolling two shields, three shields. Oh, no, it's inspired. They're all rolling two shields base all of a sudden. They're rolling their inspiration. And then you attack them, and then they all inspire, because as long as you defend once, you inspire with these guys. I forgot their inspire trigger is, is just hit me and I get mad. Um, redeploy, choose one friendly fighter on a feature token in your territory, push them up to four hexes. At the end of that push, they must be on a feature token. That's huge, especially for movement three guys. Take your position, choose up to, to or like Molog actually. I, I need the big guy warbands like the Ogres and Molog, like um, uh, Rothgorn and stuff like that too, being able to push. Choose up to two friendly fighters in your territory, other than your leader, push each chosen fighter one hex towards the nearest feature. That's great, but it's restricted to your leader, because he has to basically um, yell at them. <laughs> so it's has to be on the table for you to do it. And then Tanglebriar, place one available snare token in a hex within one of one of your fr friendly fighters. So that's basically, that's the one that's probably the most valuable, because it means that you've got um, another free feature token to put down to trigger all of your objectives with. So. That's probably the most val like if you start with that in your hand, that's a huge deal. And because you can mulligan now, you can even fish for it twice. That's a huge tango bar is a big deal. As long as you're on like so like end of your first turn, you've moved on to your initial wall, you can drop, you can finish that wall and have like a whole line of like um, stuff across the middle. All right, upgrades. Bold Engineer, plus two move except during a charge action. Reaction after a friendly fighter's activation, pick one friendly token. Sorry, one feature token in an empty hex adjacent to this fighter. Place that uh, feature token in that fighter's hex. You can actually move the hexes around, which is kind of cool. And plus two move, again, for slow guy factions, really cool. 
Defensive charges, reaction after this fighter's activation, stagger each enemy fighter adjacent to one or more feature tokens. They're in the same hex as a friendly fighter, then break this card so you can't get it back. Uh, Hardy Scout, you cannot give this to a large fighter. <laughs> no, plus one move, plus one wounds while they're not in your territory. Um, which means not your territory is also those middle hexes. So make sure they go on the middle one and then they'll, they'll get this upgrade. But yeah, can't give it to a big guy. Mason's Great Hammer. Uh, it's Cleave, Crit, Grievous 1, and then, which means it does 3 damage on a Grievous, and it's 2 hammers. Reaction after this fighter's activation, remove a feature token from this fighter's hex, then place another available feature token in this fighter's hex. So basically, you get to break one and turn it into something else. If you wanted to like turn that not into a stagger, you could, or turn it back into objective. Actually, you could do any available feature token too, so you could actually, the one where you have to add up to 6, you can just go grab the 9. Because all the ones that are in there that are not being used, so one to five is being used, the, the higher model number count ones are considered available, and that means that they'd be there to, to grab and put on the table. Uh, Melding Stone, a Metalith. Each hex within two hex of this fighter that contains a feature token is considered to be a cover hex in addition to all of its other types. Rapid Defender, reaction after an enemy fighter's move action. If that fi enemy fighter is uh, in no one's territory or your territory, push this fighter one hex towards that fighter. Some fighters are somewhat territorial. Siege Master, uh, reaction after this fighter's activation. If the fighter is on a feature token within one hex of no one's territory, choose up to two friendly fighters or fe on feature tokens. Give each one of them a guard token. That's actually great for um, these guys, especially because they'll end up rolling a bunch of dice and be able to roll um, succeed on, on dodges as well. And then Stalwart Sentinel, this fighter cannot be pushed by an opponent's warband while this fighter is on a feature token within one hex of no one's territory. So if you're on the wall, basically, you can't be pushed. And there we go, a gun, Star Maw. <laughs> this relic unleashes Blast of Magical Fire that can stagger the strongest foe. It auto staggers and it's two hammers for one damage, but it's got a four range. So there, my no gun faction just got a gun. <laughs> And then upgrade, Walking Wall. For the purposes of cards with a Fearsome Fortress symbol, while this fighter is not on a feature token, they're considered to be on a feature token. And this fighter's hex is considered to contain a feature token that cannot be flipped. Breach, I see no breach. And obviously that's gonna be huge for scoring most of these. So, not tons of like beef upgrades. Like obviously the gun is cool. Uh, where is it? Wow, Walking Wall is like your score master right there. Um, where's the other one? Uh, the Mason's Great Hammer is kind of neat. Hardy Scout is really good. And Bullet Engineer, Engineer is pretty cool, as long as you're not charging. Um, so those are kind of like the meat and potatoes upgrades that like make you good at fighting. Walking Wall obviously scores really well. But Stalwart Sentinel is cool for not being able to be pushed, because getting off those features can stop you from scoring during the rounds. So you probably want that on your big fighter. And you can stack these on people. So I, I'm actually really excited about this one. One, because I feel like it feeds really well into these early low model count warbands. Um, Fuel Grimnir would probably play really well with these as well too, and the, the Flame Bearers, Tusk Flame Bearers. Um, any of the like three to four model count beefy ones. Magor's Fiends would probably play really well with this as well. Uh, because it's all about like holding your ground. Now obviously lower wound count, I don't think this would play quite as well with Garrick. Although you could use the chaff to go fight and then have like Sake, Karsis, and um, Garrick hold the wall. You got a couple of, a couple options here. Uh, but I do feel like this deck in particular is going to reward those hard to remove models that could sit and cover uh, on the feature hexes, obviously, and then score these ones. So, not, and not having to go very far, right? You're just trying to hold the middle line. Um, your board placement's probably going to be important with this one, too. So, you're going to want to like define where the center is, but you don't want to be too narrow. Because you want to be able to place a bunch of features. You want to be able to get those three features down. So I think just like a, a, an offset is probably important like this. Because then you could uh, one, two, and then three with your dropped one if you want, right? And put a briar down. Although you probably don't want a briar for the first one. You probably just want to cover hex for the first one. And then place a briar when you're, when you're killing people. Or even just putting down like, like that. Um, and then your deployment's going to be important too, right? So which of these boards you put down, but most of them will have deployment within like one, two, or three of the, of the middle there. And that's it. So there we go. Another universal deck. I think this one's, it's got a cool theme. I like the idea of like building walls. I like that all of these universal decks so far kind of tell a story. Um, and allow you to kind of visualize what your guys are doing in Gnarlwood. And then also have 
that mechanically work in the game and give me a reason to get out my Steelhearts Champions and my Garrick's Reavers. That's what I was looking for from this. I was looking for an easy to, like, an easy to, an easy to wrap my head around way of continuing to play with all of my old stuff because I have so many painted warbands. Um, and I'm really excited about this season of Gnarlwood. So yeah, so this is one you'll see me feature in the future. Uh, obviously I've got, I have Deadly Depth still to show off to, and I got the two from the Gnarlwoods box. I've been trying to get together with Mike to play some games of Underworlds with his old Warbands as well. Uh, and we haven't been able to just because it's it's like, if you've got small kids season, it's everyone gets sick season. It seems like Mike is going round and round right now, having the same cold bounce around his family. So we haven't been able to actually play some games. I'm going to shoot some, hopefully, for going up in the new year, and I'm pumped that these decks are coming out relatively regularly, because that means that there's four Universal Rivals decks right now in the mix, and that's a lot of ways of playing your old Warbands, um, as well as ways of multiple ways of playing your current Warband, too, and multiple different like mixes of Nemesis stuff. You could probably mix this deck quite interestingly with some of the higher wound count like core decks uh, that have some cool like, defensive cards. I'm sure the big brain Underworlds players will be will be able to cover that for you. I'm more of the small brain Underworlds player that just wants a contemporary way of playing with my current decks. So there you go. It was easy to absorb what the deck did um, and see like the benefits of how I was gonna play with these older Warbands. And to me, that's the success. Like was I able to read through these cards and figure out what this deck was telling me to do without actually having put it down on the table and play it? Yeah. And so from my point of view, that's a design win. I want I want the game plan, like I want my, if I'm looking at this like fantasy football, I want the game plan for how I'm supposed to win the game to be relatively self-evident and obvious to me. And for me to be able to go, well, what players am I gonna slot in there to try and make it happen? And so far, so good. I'm, I'm really excited about how the design philosophy for Underworlds is going this season. And I can't wait to see the next one. So anyway, big thanks for watching. We'll see you for more Warhammer Underworlds and GMG reviews in the future. It's not a mash. Hey there, I hope you enjoyed that video. There are tons of other games already recorded for you to watch. Click over to my channel page if you haven't already and have a look to the dozens of playlists full of videos. I guarantee you'll discover a game you haven't seen played before. I put out new videos seven days a week and every day is themed to a different genre as I continue to explore the wider world of gaming. Of course, none of that's possible without you, the viewer, so click a like and subscribe if you'd like to stay on top of what's happening here daily. My two kids and I are massively grateful to be able to have the flexibility of this job so I can always maximize my time with them. If you want to support me continuing to put out this content, it's only possible because of my amazing backers on Patreon who support the studio, equipment, and model cost, as well as being how I make the bulk of my living. You can also help out by buying a t-shirt through Spreadshirt, a measuring gauge or widget from Death Ray Designs, or buying one of my games and supplements like Last Days, Gamma Wolves, and Blaster. As a way of showing my appreciation, patrons get early access to new games and supplements that I write throughout the course of the year. Huge thanks for watching, it really does help out, and happy gaming.